Back when I was in grade school, my parents packed us kids up into the Oldsmobile station wagon, and because every stereotype you've ever heard about Minnesota is true, <laughs> drove us to a monthly potluck dinner in our church's basement. <laughs> the place was gray hair and hot dish for miles. But there was this open space near the back of the room where us kids would run around in a giant circle till somebody barfed, so we were actually pretty happy with the setup. After dinner, which consisted in this steaming heap of indiscernible main dishes that somehow all contained jello <laughs> and beef, <laughs> my brother James and I excused ourselves to go play upchuck roulette. Just then, however, a woman who was so old, I literally thought she might be the one that we were addressing the Hail Marys to, grabbed each of us by the ears and started breathing in our faces. Oh, you two are just so cute. <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? Now, this was actually a very convenient time for her to ask. You see, James and I had just changed future occupational plans. <laughs> Up until a few weeks prior, I had been going through a particularly pious phase and had wanted to be a martyr for the true faith. I should mention that I was also homeschooled and all those stereotypes are also true. <laughs> James, meanwhile, had up until a few weeks prior wanted to be a professional dog. <laughs> My change of heart had come as the result of a long conversation with my parents, where they explained that career prospects for martyrs just weren't what they'd been a few thousand years ago, <laughs> and James's had come after he'd eaten an entire bowl of dog food at daycare, decided he couldn't stomach Purina number one dog chow for the rest of his life. In any event, I answered the woman first. I am gonna be a superhero, and I'm gonna learn how to read my the woman smiled politely and turned to James, who said, and I am going to be a dad, and I'm going to learn how to read books. <laughs> now, I actually think about this story quite a bit nowadays. You see, I've spent a significant portion of my admittedly short academic career studying narratives and finding out how they work. The more I study them, the more I'm convinced that reading minds and reading books really aren't all that different. In fact, there's quite a bit of science that suggests that the way we come to comprehend stories is just a special form of mind reading. The implications of this are huge. It'll change the way you think about listening to and telling stories. And it'll even help explain how, as some of our presenters have been arguing earlier, stories can help break down prejudices, broaden our worldviews, and change the world for the better. So, why would anyone think that reading stories is a special form of mind reading? Well, first off, I want you to think about what it means to read minds in the first place. Intuitively, I would say that mind reading is the ability to directly perceive the mental content of other minds. Less formally, it's just seeing what's going on in someone else's head. Now, we'll also need a working definition of story or narrative. So I suggest that a narrative is a verbal or textual representation of a complex set of intentional actions. Now I know, I know, that's kind of a mouthful. But let's break it down. Stories, like paintings, represent things as being in a particular way. And they do this through words that are either spoken directly to you or written down. They also focus on the actions of a few characters. So stories are just representations of those actions that fit together in a particular way. But what do I mean by intentional actions? And how do these fit together to form a story? I'll give you an example. If someone, call her Deborah, picks up a glass of water and takes a drink, that is what I would call an intentional action. If I tell you about the time that Deborah picked up a glass of water to drink the poison in order to save the queen and all her kingdom, that is what I would call a story. A good place to start, then, in thinking about how we understand narratives is to think about how we understand intentional actions. Then we can think about how we understand complex sets of such actions and then representations of such complex sets. So take, for example, the simple intentional action of fanning myself. I'm warm, so I wave my hand back and forth for the purpose of cooling myself down. Now, when you saw me start to do this, you probably immediately grasped what I was doing. You didn't even have to think about it. You just perceived my action and the purpose in light of which it's intelligible like that. How does your brain do that? Here's one thought. 
maybe you quickly ran through a series of mental inferences. You might have said to yourself, gee, it looks hot up there on stage, but when it's hot on stage, people are generally uncomfortable and want to cool down. One way to cool down would be just move your hand back and forth in front of your face. That's exactly what he's doing. He's probably just doing that in order to cool down. For a long time, this is exactly what cognitive scientists thought was going on. They thought that our brains just worked incredibly quickly and below the level of consciousness in order to manually decode every intentional action we perceive. But it turns out that we simply perceive too many intentional actions for things to work this way. We would just get overloaded. So this was really puzzling to scientists. But then in the early 90s, they discovered the answer, and sort of by accident. A group of Italian researchers wanted to figure out what goes on in your brain when you complete simple goal-directed actions. So they strapped brain scanners onto a bunch of monkeys and had them perform simple tasks. When one of these monkeys, call him Dave, would reach for and eat a piece of fruit, its neural networks would light up in this particular way, exhibiting a certain pattern. So far, things were going exactly as the scientists had expected. But then something happened that the scientists didn't expect. When Dave observed another monkey, call him Bob, reaching for and eating a piece of fruit, Dave's brain lit up in exactly the same way it had when he himself had completed this activity. Via simple perceptual cues then, Dave's brain was able to mirror the mental content of Bob. In a sense, Dave was being transported into the mind of Bob simply by observing him. <coughs> Scientists referred to the neural networks underlying this phenomenon as mirror neurons. Now, mirror neurons would help us solve our puzzle. When you see me start to do this, your brain mimics the way in which my brain is acting. My action becomes intelligible to you because you perceive it in a significant sense from my point of view. This ability has come to be known as mind reading. So, as you'll recall, according to my definition, stories are just representations of intentional actions. But it turns out, that mirror neurons even help us understand such representations. Let me give you another example, again featuring my brother James. So, when James and I were kids, we used to have a favorite game. We would run around the house collecting all the pillows, put them at the bottom of the stairs, and then leap off the staircase into the pillows below. Like I said, we were homeschooled. So, <laughs> one particular day, when we were doing this, James developed a particular ritual. He would set his feet, launch into the air, he would land, boom, and then he would celebrate. Yeah! <laughs> we had been doing this for about 10 or 15 minutes when I got a little bit bored, and I said to James, James, I bet you couldn't jump off the fifth step. James looked at me, and he looked at the step. <gasps> oh! The fifth step? Okay. So we backed up to the fifth step. He launched into the air. <laughs> Landed, boom! celebrated. Yeah! <laughs> Again, after about 10 or 15 minutes, I got bored and I said to James, James, I bet you couldn't jump off the seventh step. James looked at me and he looked at the step. Oh, not yet. What you did the seventh step? <gasps> okay. <laughs> so he backed up, launched into the air. <laughs> there was just one problem. You see, our stairs go down at an angle into the basement like this and the ceiling meets the wall at an angle about like this. So James realized what you're all realizing now, except in midair. It looked something like this. And then he hit the stairs. And I started to panic. I thought, oh my goodness, I just killed James. So I called down, James, are you okay? Everything was silent for about a minute. And then James looked up at me, and he said, yeah! <laughs> now, I love telling that story, because every time I get to the part where James hits his head, about half the people in the audience reach up their foreheads, and everybody winces. This is because your brain is transporting you into James's position in the story. Your mirror neurons are firing in such a way that it allows you to experience the collision as if it were firsthand. In this way, then, mirror neurons can allow us to read the minds of characters that, like James in this example, are merely represented. Now, there are a number of exciting implications of all this, but the one that I'm most interested in is the potential that this capacity has 
for explaining what goes on when we read fictional stories. Novels, for instance, often represent not only external intentional actions, like fanning yourself, but the entire inner world of their protagonists. And they do so at the same level of detail at which those protagonists themselves experience the world. As Annie Murphy Paul puts it in her 2012 New York Times article, fiction, with its redolent details, imaginative metaphors, and attentive descriptions of people and their actions, offers an especially rich replica. Indeed, in one respect, novels go beyond simulating reality to give readers an experience unavailable off the page, the opportunity to enter fully into other people's thoughts and feelings. In an even more significant sense, then, novels can allow us to experience the world from someone else's point of view. Now, this isn't all good news, of course. There may well be minds that we ought not to read, as well as worldviews that we really shouldn't sympathize with, but on the whole, the potential this capacity has for good is overwhelming. By challenging ourselves to inhabit the perspectives of those who have led very different lives than we have, we can break down the barriers and miscommunications that separate us. We can empathize and understand people even if we don't agree with them. And this empathy and understanding <laughs> truly has the power to change the world. So when we were kids, I wanted to learn how to read minds and James wanted to learn how to read books. Surprisingly though, it might turn out that these capacities are far more similar than we might have thought. The best way to go about reading another mind then might just be to pick up and read another book.